Hi, um, I'm Lynn Parker. I'm the founder of Funny Women. Uh, we're here today to talk about how women are going to impact on the future of advertising, or are they already doing so? Um, now, advertising uh, is already proving to be a really brave new world window uh, on our COVID society. And as we all know, it does influence what we eat, what cars we drive, what perfume and clothes we wear, and what insurance we buy. Um, I actually want this amazing panel to discuss uh, whether this picture is still being painted and guided by men. And uh, as our tectonic plates of our world are changing and shifting, discuss how women are taking the lead in depicting a more open, diverse and caring society. Uh, for example, uh, we're seeing a lot more feminine references in, in advertising uh, from depictions of vaginas, uh, discussion about periods, menopause, childbirth, incontinence, and it's all, all happening in front, of our, in front of our very eyes on a screen near you. How is this actually changing the landscape? And are we as more women, uh, and are we as women more free than ever to talk about our bodies and our minds? And is this contributing to more acceptance of our creative worth? Um, I actually set up Funny Women 18 years ago to improve the gender balance on the comedy circuit. And two years ago, I launched the Hilarious Initiative uh, as I saw that, the, that there were lots of parallels between the way female creatives were being sidelined in the world of advertising. Now I represent a community of brilliant performers, writers and creators who can direct, who can animate, they can act and they can de depict the world as it really is, at least 50% female. So why is there not more female creative direction? I, I also believe that women are true agents for change and often they will take the lead in adversity. Um, they're not just the caretakers, but we are the creators and the visionaries, which is why we're seeing this feminine seed of change in advertising. Yet, while this is happening on one level, Sadly, there's a lot of evidence to support that lockdown has impacted on women far more catastrophically than men. Um, domestic violence has increased. Women take the lead on childcare, as I'm sure we'll, we'll discover. And more women have lost their jobs in the, in the lower paid sectors and the gig economy. Now, I brought together four amazing female visionaries from the media and advertising industry to discuss how women can really save the advertising industry. So um, I'm going to start by introducing our first panellist, the wonderful Jane Osler, who is the global head of media effectiveness for Kantar. And Jane and I have actually worked together before on a few things. So over to you, Jane. Thank you, Lynn. That's a great introduction. And I thought um, I'd start by just sharing a few things that you may or may not know from um, some research we've been doing throughout um, the pandemic from early March onwards. It's actually a global piece of research called the uh, COVID-19 barometer, and we did it in eight different waves, so at fairly regular intervals um, throughout the last few months. Um, and just make some general points about what women are saying versus what men are saying, because I think it might provide some useful context. So um, women are actually more anxious overall about the pandemic. So 74% are saying they're anxious versus 60% of men. Um, so it's quite high sort of anxiety levels. Um, and that's not hugely surprising if you think about some of the areas of responsibility that women have that Lynn, Lynn was talking about. They're much more concerned about the health of their families. So 86% um, versus 77% of men. And they're feeling the impact on day-to-day -day life, which again, is not hugely surprising given that I'm sure many of us have, have felt that ourselves. So 63% of women have felt the impact on day-to-day -day life, um, much fewer men, just over half. Um, the other thing is the financial situation. Um, and I think, um, as Lynn said, um, you know, more women are, we know more women are represented in um, more lower paid sectors of employment in the UK. Um, but overall, 56% of women say that they've had to think more about their financial situation and their financial planning. And again, that's way more than men at 44%. Um, and it's impacted women's mental health more as well. So 43% say it's had a negative impact. And that's obviously what they're saying about their own mental health. 
um, versus 32 uh, percent of men. So it doesn't paint a great picture overall of how women have been faring, I think, throughout the last few months. What we also did was we put people into segments, different groups, and we gave the groups different names. So, um, for example, I'll give you an example. There's ostriches. So ostriches are just like, it's all fine. We'll just carry on as normal. Um, put my head in the sand, you know, really confident. There are good citizens who want to do everything properly and they wear a mask when they should and they sort of observe social distancing. Um, but there are two segments where women are more prevalent, if you like. So this is a, a general trend. Um, and they are the precarious warriors um, and distressed dreamers. Um, so those two tribes, if you like, are much more female um, and distressed dreamers are worried about getting sick. Um, they need help. Um, they're concerned about their friends, their family and themselves. Um, and, you know, it's it, these are the segments which need more support and more help. So obviously it doesn't paint a great picture of how women are faring. A lot of people have been doing extremely well. But I think there's an underlying sense of anxiety and worry which has been impacting us all. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention, if there is time, if that's all right, is it's another piece of research that we've done in the G7 countries, which is um, called the Reykjavik Index for Leadership. And I thought this might lead on to the advertising conversation later, which, again, I'm afraid I'm not bringing great news here. It doesn't give brilliant news. about. We asked men and women about their perceptions of female leaders, both in government and in, in commercial businesses in the G7 countries. Uh, the UK didn't do particularly well um, amongst the four of the seven nations that were that were interviewed. Um, it came in fourth place, mainly because men were, were scoring lower um, overall. The men were scoring um, perceptions of female leadership at a lower level. Um, and I don't know whether this is going to surprise you or not, really, but 58% um, of people in the UK, so it's a general population as a whole, would feel comfortable um, with um, a woman at head of government. 58%. Um, and that's that's you know amongst men and women um, and then 59 percent of people in the UK would feel comfortable having a woman as CEO you know so it does make you question what the other 40 percent are thinking really doesn't it, <laughs> it doesn't feel comfortable with it. Um, and it's higher amongst women women are more likely to say that they're comfortable with women in senior leadership positions than men but um, you know I still find it very surprising I mean it's actually worse in companies like in sorry in countries like Germany um, but, you know, it's still very surprising that we still have this massive perception gap about women even being able to do particular jobs. So um, on that slightly depressing note, um, I'll, I'll pass back to you, Lynn. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, great, but really useful and echoes some research that Funny Women did back in 2014, actually, about women's leadership. So we can reference that at some point. Um, so I'm going to move swiftly on uh, to Lisa Goodchild, who is the founder of DigiWoo and the Digi Learning Foundation. She describes herself as the chief troublemaker. So we need we need a few more disruptors. So uh, over to you, Lisa. <laughs> Yeah, well, I am. That was great news, Jane. I really enjoyed those um, stats. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Lynn. Yeah, we are in um, interesting times. And I must say, as a woman, I do find that I've uh, taken on way too much running my own business and a charity and then trying to do the home learning, which I slowly gave up on very quickly. <laughs> like most of my friends, because it was really difficult. And also, I think, um, also, I think I had to... Uh, push my voice more louder with my partner and be much more vocal in terms of going, no, it's going to be, you know, one day you, one day me, and we need to take turns and be a lot more stricter. I think as women, um, you know, we are so used to being programmed to take it all on that we just start picking up the pieces. And it's really, really harsh. And also when you think of that they, those stats in terms of a CEO um, or a prime minister, how it's really interesting that most young men or boys up until the age of 16 are cared by, um, by their mum. You know, we look after these amazing young men. Well, you know, we do have to um, take a look internally, maybe, at what we're doing with these young boys. As I said to my mum, stop wiping my younger brother's bum until he was eight you know she didn't do that for me <laughs> she felt she had to do it for him and uh, you know look 
we, we take on far too much and I think we've just got to start pushing and not having it anymore. Um, it was interesting recently, I had to explain to my 15 year old that uh, about page three, you know, the sun back in the day, I said it, it was the main source in the UK for news. So it was equivalent to Google. You'd go on there, you'd turn a page and there was a girl there with her breasts out. And my 15 year old just couldn't believe it. You know, when we look at these times and the, you know, we have evolved, thank goodness. And I think in the last 10 years, women coming together has been uh, the biggest movement and um, us supporting each other um, and lifting each other and you can't be what you can't see and you know um, I was really lucky I grew up dysfunctional upbringing my mum suffered from mental health issues we were kicked out of the the door we bought ourselves up we used to go and hustle for food but now it's at 40 that I'm really like 41 um, I'm realizing what an asset that was in terms of my mum had no structure there was many fathers you know in the family with many children um i was never forced i'm not married i will not be married i just it's not something i aspire to i definitely watched a lot more jungle book as a child and not um the disney princesses but yeah you know um it's interesting and having a 15 year old daughter and a six year old daughter i'm fighting you know i'm not gonna let this um lie down and i remember about I think it was about seven years ago, ad tech, um, I went to ad tech and there was like, there was a bar with two girls on poles, on oh, yeah. pole dancing. I mean, what on earth? And you know, for our girls in particular, it's growing up in the state schools specifically, which is why we've got Digi Learning, because we're trying to lift these young girls to realize that they can go into these amazing careers. And it's not, you know, like coding, for example, they all think it's a man sitting in a room on a computer. And, you know, digital, we know digital is not that space. It touches every single career. But yeah, I'm super excited about the movement we're making, but in particular, my 15 year old daughter, because she just can't believe you know if I was to tell her those stats she'd be like what so you know I think there's going to be big changes from our young people hopefully that's brilliant Lisa and I, I echo so much of it I have a 28 year old daughter and a 32 year old son and yeah I mean the idea of pole dancing is I mean it's just so far removed from their experiences so yeah Good. Um, moving on, and actually uh, appropriately, I feel, because um, I'm going to introduce Lucy Cave. She's the creative editorial director of Bauer Media, representative of lots of different kinds of media as well. So um, over to you, Lucy. And are you happy to just have a yeah, chat? Yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to say appropriately because she happens to be a pole dancer. <laughs> <laughs> I tried uh, pole dancing once, I was a robber. <laughs> Um, it's really interesting that your your points, Lisa, actually, because you were talking about, um, you know, your background and having kind of, you know, mental health issues. And I think one of the points about how women are going to sort of change and drive um, the ad industry and make differences is around the fact that we're kind of we're not just defined by the fact that we're women. You know, it's it's interse we're intersectional women. So it's it's kind of our race, our sexual orientation, you know, mental health issues. If you look at anything, this not necessarily in advertising itself, but anything that kind of makes you sit up and take notice and gets people talking are, you know, our moments where kind of the intersectionality of women have taken place. So it's like Michaela Cole's amazing, I may destroy you and the sort of nuanced interpretation of sexual assault and that being both harrowing and ultimately really funny as well. Um, and, you know, obviously as Lynn said, I work for for brands such as Grazia, which is really sort of driving the change um, and pushing the, the rights of women. And we had a really great piece that was written uh, online by the Shadow Minister for Sport, Alison McGovern, a week ago. And she was talking about the fact that she had mental health issues and, and was opening up about her sort of body image issues and the fact that she felt like everyone was shouting, you're fat every time she was on TV. And um, that honesty and that vulnerability just meant that, an article like that made such an impact and so many different people were kind of posting about it and retweeting about it and saying I hope that my daughters kind of can can listen to what you're saying and, and that's that's the idea of having a role model it's that sort of vulnerability and that that openness and that honesty from women I think and um, Mary Porter's talks about uh, the kindness economy 
which was before COVID, but that was obviously um, talking about retail and, you know, businesses that are going to win are the ones that are kinder to their people and their planet. And I think that's the, that's evidential in not just kind of retail business, but in, in media brands as well. And we've, you know, we've looked at uh, kindness amongst our audiences. We've got a mental health campaign that goes across all of our Bauer brands, uh, which I've been leading. And we've got um, in the lead up to World Mental Health, they were asking people to pledge kindness. And interestingly, when we looked at all of our audiences, it was the the grazia, the the women that um, said that they were they they were kind of they felt that kind of kindness and that community spirit, and they valued kindness a lot more now and than ever before, much more than the, than than the men in our audience, unsurprisingly. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, we've done. I mean, you know, it's it's been a really interesting time for for media brands. You know, the pandemic, and I actually think it's meant that. Uh, particularly you know I don't want to obviously there's a lot of kind of men leading certain brands who've done some really great creative work but I think the women particularly have kind of just adapted and pivoted and done stuff that you know that that really is completely stand out and really reflects what their audiences want and I think it's that you know it's that change that I think a lot of women kind of embrace and and flourish in that's brilliant, Lucy. And I, I think that you picked up on something I feel so important, which is that whole thing about the messiness of life, you know, women's lives. It isn't glamorous, you know, and we've always glamorized everything, particularly in advertising. And I'll, I'll, I'll bring, um, I'll bring uh, Jane back in, in uh, after we've heard from our last speaker. But um, because there has been a lot of discussion around how, what we're meant to do, you know, and men are men are terrified of seeing uh, images of vaginas on tv but that that's it that's what we have they have to live with that you know and and the michaela cole thing i've spoken to quite a few men who found it very hard to watch very hard to watch so um onward um i'm now introducing the lovely karen carter she's the managing director of chaos marketing and um also works as uh, on the board of the International Advertising Association and Bloom. So over to you, Karen. Yes, and of course now my dog will start to bark in the background, but that is life in- <laughs> That's all right. It's life real life. life. You know? <laughs> I, it's been fascinating listening to all of this stuff. And I think what you know, maybe I bring to the party as it were is, so, so most of my career I've been on the brand side of marketing, but you know, I think it, you were talking, we were talking a bit about that kind of home experience, et cetera. I was, and I realize now in, in how lucky I was uh, to have two supportive parents, but I had a mother who had multiple degrees and had a PhD. And when I would go and say, mommy, mommy, I wanna be a nurse, she'd say, okay, but what about being the doctor? So it was that constant push. And she was the one in the neighborhood that was definitely a bit different because she called it like she saw it, good, good New Yorker uh, and those sorts of things. And I think that while having that support, also being told things like, guess what you get for going to work every day, a paycheck. So you need to show up and get your things done and those sorts of things. And, and I think all of those influences also are what shape, you know, so the messages at home. But then what I think is also becomes interesting is, I know as I've gone through my career, I start out as a grip, which if you know anything about TV production is the kind of low where you lug gear around. And I was the only woman in the entire city that I worked in that did this. So the thick skin was learned of having big, you know, union guys touching parts of my body that was not appropriate for them to touch or saying things that were just completely out of line. So whereas I got a thick skin, it also, which I think has helped, it also kind of taught me how you have a voice. And I think going to what was talking about is more women's voices rise up and do this in unison, um, we can start to see that that big impact. And, and certainly as I shifted into more leadership roles, suddenly it was what role can I play? How do I be a part of the solution uh, as opposed to the problem? And having worked most of my career in the tech sector, I've been fascinated by how many women do not lift up and support. It's very much, I need to play like the boys to be successful. But I think what we're starting to see, and this is where you know I posit that brands probably have as much, if not even more of, a, of an opportunity to drive that impact, because when it comes to advertising media, they hold the purse strings. As the client, what role can they play? So what you're starting to see are, 
as more women get into or in CMO or leadership roles, like still Salar Diageo going out a couple of years ago and writing a letter to all of her agencies saying, I want to see your stats on gender diversity in the pay gaps. Or a uh, woman, Berta de Pablos, who was um, at Mars. And both of those brands, Diageo and Mars, defining strategies around gender equality in the actual ads that you're seeing. Um, and seeing organizations start to work at doing studies on pronouns in, in, publi in publishing and things like that, going through 15, 18 years of, of The Guardian and starting to see where gender pronouns come in and the impact of that. And ultimately how that will impact the bottom line. I mean, we're seeing traditionally male brands hire women, female leaders like Ellie Norman at F1. The new CMO of the National Basketball Association in the US is a woman, Kate Javeri, who I was privileged enough to work with. Um, so the, as that starts to happen, I think we can start to see, and this, I personally believe this is why we're starting to see vagina show up on TV and seeing this stuff is to push those dialogues. Um, even the BBC now had this great visual for at conversations around menopause of physical tampons, three of them tied with red string. You know, it's, it's that being open about those, what happens to women and women being able to tell those stories is what's, yeah, I think, where we start to see that change. We're also seeing, I mean, the impact is really obvious. There's some great stats I found. Companies with gender diversity were 25% more likely to uh, have above average profitability. Um, that my favorite stat was from McKinsey, advancing women's equality can add 12 trillion US dollars to global growth. I mean, if it comes down to the numbers game, when businesses that are more diverse, or there's great stats around crowds, PwC did something around crowd set funding, female entrepreneurs were 23% more successful in reaching their, goal, their numbers. And I think that's because of the EQ that comes with that. And you were talking about kindness and how all that comes together. And that women generally, just by the nature of, frankly, you know, millions of years of evolution, take that more kind approach or looking end to end versus just having their heads down and focus on a, a final number, for example. Um, but sadly, kind of to Jane's point, still a long way to go, IPA's most recent agency census, you know, shows that the diversity improvements, particularly in agencies, are marginal at best and it's slow. Um, you know, the gender pay gap, particularly creative and other agencies is 28.1%. Media agencies, it's a little bit less. And there's that disparity across just about every level, maybe bar C-suite. So I think the work continues. And I think we've all seen the articles that have come out during COVID of even more of that impact as you know, people were talking about the balancing of everything in the home and all that. So I think that while there's more freedoms coming and the fact that women are talking as a group, there's all those great opportunities. I still think that we need to keep being loud and disruptive and shake things up I know I work with a group in Bloom around the menopause. That is, and that one's, as people were talking about, women feeling comfortable about that. At the same time, I even, the word comes out of my mouth. I'm like, oh, that's, because suddenly that's your age. I talk about it. Talk and all that kind of stuff. So getting comfortable about that. Well, you know, as, as people go on stock and job search, I've talked to women about this. Yeah. As soon as you, you know, the changes you have to make as a woman in your CV to drop years off of your CV, my LinkedIn profile looks very different. I will look at men's profiles. They'll put the year they graduated from university. I've been told not to, because you don't want to look be so old. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done in looking women through that entire journey of their career. And just to your point, starting to just tell the stories and just making, being okay with it. So. Thanks, Karen. I think there's several things here just that I'd like to bring into the panel discussion. We've obviously got, you know, five of us are all, female leaders in our own spheres and we are working women uh, we've got families I think we've all got families <laughs> we've all got kids we're all doing the juggling act um, I've been through the menopause I talk about it all the time but I do feel that weight of being an older woman in a fairly young environment um, you know and we, and we have the pressures of how we deal with that um, I want to just come back to Jane because I know there was some amazing research about the way advertising, I mean, this is all about how we get more women than we've already got. I mean, that 28% stat is a bit scary. 
Um, but you know, why why are we not why are women not dictating the landscape? What 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 is it that we why aren't we the creatives? I mean, we are the creatives, but we're not necessarily the senior creatives. We're not running the companies. We're doing the legwork again. Jane. Well, there's probably a whole load of different reasons, I think, and some of them are historical reasons why, um, you know, sort of female representation at higher levels within companies isn't, isn't happening. Um, and this is more of a, a personal anecdote, actually, from a couple of years ago that I was given the opportunity to do a more senior role. And I would actually have to seriously ask myself some questions about it, because I thought, actually, I don't want the person who was doing it, I didn't want to be like them. And then somebody had a quiet word with me and said, actually, you don't have to be like them. You don't have to do it like they've done it for the last 10 years. You can just be yourself and bring your own style to it. And I think there's, all, there's not enough of those kind of conversations that go on because you feel you've got to fit into the slot, especially if you're for a big company. Mm. There are sort of lots of men in very senior positions. Um, you know, sometimes it actually helps to talk to somebody and they can explain to you that, no, no, don't worry about it. You know, <clears throat> you can you can be yourself and just do your do it your own way. And it's almost like that is quite actually quite a liberating thought. And I think we all need to have those conversations with, with people more often. Um, but when we come to advertising, um, there's some interesting things going on, probably because there are still more male creatives than female creatives um, overall. Um, and actually, so I think the advertising world is being held back due to the representation in, in agencies. And, you know, as per the point about um, Syl from Diageo, it's not just the agencies, it's the people working on the filming, the production, the, you know, the, the, whole, the whole process. Um, and some of our research, which was pre-COVID, um, it's probably, it's maybe, who knows if it's changed since then, um, say that um, there's a big gap between what marketers think about um, gender stereotypes, if you like, and what consumers think about gender stereotype advertising. So overall, we are going to huge detail. Marketers think they're doing a pretty good job of <laughs> gender stereotypes, um, but consumers don't. And in particular, women, so female um, respondents, 76% of them say that the way they are portrayed in advertising is completely out of touch. Yeah. Now, three quarters of women, that's actually, that's a representative sample of all age groups in the pop UK population. Okay. It's actually a worry because it is- It's shocking. It is shocking. It's a worry. It's shocking. Yeah. Uh, I mean, can, I, can I just interrupt you and bring yeah. Lucy in actually on that? Because I, my background, um, I have had three careers. I started my career in women's magazines. So, you know, I've seen in my 60 plus years, not I am six, in my 60s. So I started my career in my 20s and I cannot believe the difference now um, of how, you know, it was all it was all men editors and leaders, yeah. there were very few. So Lucy, how, how is that changing in, in your sphere? You mean it, as in how many women have we got running the ship? Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, really positively, actually, um, you know, obviously, the, you know, from a from a magazine brand, we've got Grazia, which is obviously a, a women's brand. But then you've got Terry White, who runs Empire Magazine, who is brilliant um, from a kind of advertising. Our advertising leadership team is predominantly women. Our group MD radio is a woman. So I, but I think perhaps in kind of publishing it's it's probably a bit more skewed towards women but um you know for me it's kind of a it's it's very positive in that respect obviously there's still you know um the internal battles to be had but i think we are sort of we're, we're kind of pushing that door down open and um and mm. driving change as much as we can and mm. I, I want to pick up on saint lisa i think it was lisa said about role models uh, i think you talk about your 15 year old daughter but you know we don't just need female role models we need male role models who are prepared to do some of the more feminine type chores uh, in in work in the workplace um but yeah i mean in the, in the world of tech lisa uh mm. which i think women are really doing doing brilliant things in tech it seems to suit the female sensibility yeah well i think um Coming from, you know, look, in terms of diversity, it's not just women and men as well. 
you know, I grew up in a council estate, very, very, I was the bottom of the council estate. So we was yeah. extremely poor. I sold drugs as a kid. I had the most horrific um, things, you know, around me as a child. And I was very lucky to get out of that. But I don't know how, you know, I was very lucky to have Shah Wasmond, June Sarpong, um, Kanye King take me under their wing, really, and believe in me and sort of encourage me to believe in myself and, you know, Mary King Dawson. But I do think in terms of the digital space, it's, um, it's quite open in terms of being who you are. And I think the more I'm starting to, as you said, Jane, the more you start being who you are, the, the better it becomes. And, you know, years ago, I remember people saying, you should have elocution lessons and all of that crap and I you know thank goodness I didn't because I wouldn't I don't want to change I don't want to you know but I actually it used to I used to feel you know less confident or are people going to have an opinion of me and now I just don't care if you don't like me you don't like me if you do you do you know and um, I just think in terms of um, digital though we do a lot of workshops with digi learning we go to a lot of schools and when you have a group of you know they saw me with my swagger and my heels and all these girls come to this workshop and they sit down and they say miss what workshop is this and I'm like digital and they went to get up to walk out and I had to like frog march them back in and go <laughs> girls why are you feeling like that what's you know what's the purpose what's the reason and it was because they didn't picture themselves within digital they don't realize all the amazing things you can do with digital so I was like right what do you want to be and the young girl said I want to be um, a beautician I was like, you, you definitely need to know digital. You need to know video editing. You need to start putting your videos up. You need to start building your profile, your, your digital footprint. So then people see you. And then if you're amazing at that, people like Grazia, they'll, you know, everyone will want you. And it was just, it, it was that little, you know, that, that switch that they went, oh my gosh, yes, you are right. But we must start at the bottom. And as we all know, you know, it's not, it's not our teachers fault because they're amazing but the education government um you know that needs changing and um that fourth pillar of education needs to be digital because it is so important i think with covid we've seen that um but yeah i'm hoping you know i'm trying to open up as many young what young women's minds to say get into digital because it's a brilliant space to be in and and also i've noticed i mean that class thing is so important i come from a working class background i completely get it I can remember one of my mum's friends saying to me in the street when I was about seven or eight, saying, "Yeah, don't you, don't you all in speak posh?" <laughs> but, you know, it was just, and I just spoke as I spoke. I don't speak any differently now. But you know, we've 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 got we've got to stop. We've got to get rid of those boundaries. I mean, advertising now. I've no. I'm, I was actually going to bring in um, Karen uh, because advertising to me seems to have become extremely diverse now. <laughs> I mean, I, who's writing those narratives? We've got, you know, we've got gay, lesbian, uh, mixed race, uh, disabled. I mean, just ev everything is piling in. Great, great. But is there a danger, she said slightly nervously, of us trying too hard, you know? Karen? Yeah. It, it, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I'll, t I'll try and tackle that one. Yeah, so, so I guess the short answer would be, Possibly. I mean, I think I'd rather see more of that and, and, you know, it's the, I'd rather see more of it and then maybe have to back off than seeing yeah. none of it. I do think that where that's starting to happen is because people in leadership roles, both men and women, if we look at like the, like Jerry Dakin, who happens to be a gay man and what he and the other leadership at a, at a company like GSK, I mean, it's, it's, it's pharma as those kind of products is starting to think about those things that we're going to see more of that representation. And I think for young people seeing themselves, you know, the Starbucks coffee ads, you know, transgender and all that. So I would rather see more of that than less, but where I, and I've struggled through my career when you start getting into things like quotas and all that stuff. Like I used to get told at a large tech company, I won't say out loud, you know, it was one of these like, well, the next one has to be a woman. It's like, I don't care if they are, as I joke, as an American, a high five and white guy, if they're the right fit for role, and more importantly, what diversity do they bring to the table that you cannot see? So that leads into a whole conversation around neurodiversity and how you bring in as a, an extreme extrovert, some of the most valuable and wonderful you know, relationships or, or when I've gotten some of the most incredible feedback has been from the introvert in the room who sits back and observes 
and then suddenly drops these beautiful gems of creative ideas or ways of thinking that you haven't thought about. So, so I guess I would rather see it go probably too far the other direction and have to be reined back a bit I, I, with the risk of it being seen as, oh, I'm just going to go do this ad because everyone needs, I think I should. I think I'd rather go there because if that helps future generations to come in and we're seeing, you know, like, like what you were talking about, Lisa, or, or groups like Brixton Finishing School and how that those underrepresented peoples of color, et cetera, especially women of color are seeing that reflected back, whether that's in film, whether that's in the creatives we see in advertising and what's written, what they, you know, learn in school. It's only going to help with future generations to start seeing more and more of the, like when I talked about some of the things that have happened to me personally as a woman, I've had young men sitting across to me just gobsmacked because they <laughs> just never, they haven't seen it because to them it was like, well, it's a woman, it's a man who cares. And that blending, which I think is hope for the future as it were. Yeah, I, and speaking as someone who's now old enough to be everybody, everybody's mother, it, it's even more shocking when it when you speak normally, you know. But they think, well, you shouldn't be talking like that. You're you're you know you're you're an older woman. You're not allowed to. Um, <laughs> we, we could have a whole panel on that, couldn't we? Really. Um, I I do um I do want to pick up on the point though of the extremes because. Uh, in the world of comedy, and I've, you know, I've been working in comedy for 18 years, there were lots of things we couldn't say or we were told not to say when I started out. Now, we regular, the language has completely changed. Women talk about everything. And there is also, there was a point in time where everything got very extreme and very graphic. And, and you know, actually, but it's, it's leveling off now. And, and, you know, you're seeing women performing on an equal playing field to men, a lot of very significant, uh, you know, high profile female comedians who are, who are making an impact and have a voice. And a, cu a culture is a reflection of what's going on in, this, in society. So that's a good thing. Um, I, I'm conscious of time. So I'm gonna bring everyone in for a last sort of comment on this. Um, Lucy, please talk very briefly about the, the, the Where's Your Head At campaign, because I think, I know you're doing that at Bauer, but I think it's a very important uh, sort of strategy that we other businesses could be employing. So yeah, briefly, a couple of years ago, I launched a mental health initiative uh, internally and externally for our consumers across Bauer called Where's Your Head At? Um, the idea ultimately being to drive change and try and get a law change so we have mental health first aiders in every workplace and college. Um, but we're doing lots of um, activity around our brands and internally just to keep opening up that conversation around mental health ultimately and, and let people know it's okay not to be okay. Um, the latest phase of our campaign in the lead up to World Mental Health Day is asking people to pledge an act of kindness um, and pin it to an interactive map of the UK, which I will share with you all. Um, it's just where's your head at .org forward slash pledge kindness. Um, and that map also connects people to um, help in their local area with an uh, initiative called the Hub of Hope. So you type in your postcode if you're worried about anything and it brings up a whole heap of kind of therapists and counselors in your area. So it, for us, it's just around kind of just pushing change and making people, you know, it's stupid that we have first aiders, physical first aiders and not mental health first aiders in every workplace. Yeah, absolutely. College. You know, yeah. you, should, you should be able to speak to someone if you're feeling crap and you're having a rubbish day and you want to be open and it's not just someone in HR. I, I do think as a comment, it's a female influence on business, actually. I think this is where we are. This is where we are powerful. Yeah. Um, creatively, quick question, Lisa. So, oh, look, uh, it's about starting from the root down. It's about us all collaborating. You know, um, it's about supporting initiatives. So Brixton Finishing School, Digi Learning, what we do, we get young people and also the, the, as you said, Lucy, their wellness. So it's a big part of our program is mental health care. I'm very passionate about it. I've had a lot of people around me deal with it. I've had a lot of picking up, you know, suicides, lots of bad stuff happening that if there was the help out there, it would be more impactful. And, you know, the other day we had somebody who needed mental health, um, someone to speak to, but the telephone line closed at eight o'clock. Well, I'm sorry, but anyone I know who goes through mental health issues, it's through the night. So we really need to look at that. But yeah, it's about supporting these initiatives, stop talking, start doing, as Shah Wasmond would say, <laughs> and make it happen, you know? Um, there's some amazing programs out there doing amazing stuff. We're trying to get those, you know, we, what we've got is like 30 young people from the UK, from all types of backgrounds, 
autistic, uh, you know, every level. We've got five from Jamaica, five from Barbados. So we're, this is our first pilot. So we're really going to try and see what magic happens. We've got 80% from underprivileged, 20% from privileged, but haven't gone on the straight and narrow. So um, I'll come back with you to tell you what this pilot has worked out to be. But I'm looking to see some real magic. And I think there's a lot of magic that a lot of organisations can do. Um, just a quick, quick word each from, from Karen and from Jane, but just to quickly say, as women and mothers, we're on call 24 seven anyway. So, you know, that's, that's another thing. Jane. Um, yeah, I was going to end on, I know some of the data I've been giving you and insights are sort of not, not hugely um, inspirational, but um, or, or slightly negative, but there is some hope, I think, ahead. So we asked women um, what they thought um, brands should do to help drive recovery and change um, from the pandemics. And, you know, brands have huge uh, stake in this because they have enormous amounts of money to be able to spend on communications. Therefore, it's their right and their responsibility to communicate um, you know, positive messages and progressive messages and perhaps slightly leading messages, even if they're sort of taking, having to take people with them. But more women than men think brands should play a role in driving recovery and change. So I think it gives us a bit of hope that actually, you know, some meaningful activity, and we've seen some of it in the last six months can happen through brands uh, communicating things. And, you know, on a personal level, I see it's my job to make sure I communicate this well to all of our clients, you know, to make sure that they understand that this is what people are really thinking they should be doing. So I think we all have a different responsibility in different parts of what we do. And I think that's, that's part of my role to make sure that people understand that brands should be having more purposeful relationships with their consumers. Jane, thank you very much. We're out of time. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, sorry not to come back to you, Karen, but we're 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 up time-wise. But that was the most amazing discussion. I think we've had so much insight. Thank you all very much for taking part. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.